had no choice. You know, our homes and our lives and our families' lives are at stake from this project. So we, we couldn't afford just to sit back and let it happen because it was going to ruin us anyway. So that was the reason that I said, look, somebody has to stand up and do something about this. So that's where it all began. We started to protest. We started to look for information from Shell for the, con you know, the authority they had to come onto our land and the authority they had to do, do such a thing. So 10 years later, we're still waiting for these consents to be shown to us. So then we started to protest and that's where it all led to the 10 years, you could say, that we're, we're fighting this and we have, you know, Shell are getting no further than we are as such. So that's what took me to get back under that lorry about a month ago. You know, they started to get go into SAC, a place that's highly protected from Europe and the community have looked after it for years. And they, they just decided to drive in there with their trucks and their diggers and start rooting it out. So I just decided to go back under a lorry to stop it from working. Now, it wasn't moving at the time, which people think it was. But, you know, I'm some sort of lunatic to go back under a lorry, but it wasn't. It was a parked lorry waiting to unload. So I just went back under it and held it up there for, you know, so many hours. So the guards came along about midday and you know worked very hard on me trying to get me out you know they abused me physically and you know every way they could five or six of them they were, they, they, they were sweating trying to get pull me back from under this truck and I just asked them to bring me the super and that I wanted to talk to them and to see that the permission they had to get onto the SSE and destroy it so instead of bringing me the super or bringing me any sort of information they abused me verbally and physically you know they took off my boots and they twisted my toes to get me to lose my grip the one guard picked up a stone with a sharp edge in it and he rammed it through my ankle you know scraped my ankle into the bone with it which was fierce painful but I still didn't give in no, you know, another guy made a comment, he said, Willie, we've cut the leg off you. So, you know, I just said, well, if you can, you can do if you want, you'll only have my leg. So, I mean, that's, that's what we're getting into now at the moment, which is rather dangerous and frightful for us. You know, this, the government aren't listening to us, the guards are on Shell's side. So it's, it's getting very serious there, for us it is, you know. So then that was, I thought that was bad. But later on that night, I was still under the truck and I decided to come out to the thing had got quiet and a lot of the security had gone away and the guards had gone away. So I came out from under the truck to stretch my legs or have a walk around for myself because the place I was in was pretty narrow for somebody my size. So my se I was there at the side of the truck myself and my brother-in-law, Pete Lavelle. We were just, I was walking over and back and I was talking to him. So with that he said to me, I think Willie, he said, I hear people come and run. So with that, before I had time to get back under the truck, the, these gang of seven or eight people with dark clothing and, and their faces covered just grabbed me. And one of them hit me on the side of the head with a, something like a baton or to that effect. And the next thing I felt myself on the ground with four of them kneeling above me, they put me down on my side, which I think they were professional at their job. You know, they were either guards or security. I just cannot say who they were because it was dark and I was on the ground and I couldn't see anyway because they were punching me into the ground with their knees. And one one of them had a, his knee in my ear and he was pushing my head into the ground, which was very, very severe on, on my head. So they kept that up for quite a while. You know, and I could feel myself getting short of breath and that kind of thing. So I just was talking to myself, look at I said, I think this is it. Like, you know, I thought I was finished. So I acted dead. You know, I just fell limp and he used to let go of my hand every now and again to see, you know, what I put up, any reaction or that kind of thing. So I just let my hand, I had a little torch in my hand and I let it fall out of it. And my hands went limp and I let my tongue out the side of my mouth. And one guy said to the other guy, leave him now, I think he's nearly finished anyway. So, I mean, it was, it was a terrible, you know, it was a terrible experience for me. I just thought I was going to, I thought they were going to kill me. So, 
with that then they eased off on me. So they got off me, which it was a relief for my whole body. You know, I was clammed up and I, I couldn't breathe properly. Now, I was I was in a bad state. So it was, you know, if I died there and then, there would be no marks on me because they, the way they did it, like they didn't leave any hands on my face or that kind of thing. So it was days later before all my bruises showed up. So if I did die there on the spot, I would, you know, they could, it wouldn't be said that I got abused. So that's why I think they were professional people. So I was there on the ground, even though it was reported that I was escorted to the ambulance by the guards, I wasn't, I wasn't able to move. I was taken onto the ambulance by a stretcher and brought to Castlebad Hospital, which my, I had x-rays and all that, but it was more muscle pains I had and muscle disorder, you know, rather than being marked at the time. Even saying that though, there was a big, big gash on my ankle now, where the guard dripped me with the stone. That was the worst gas, gash I had. So for us, it's, it's, it's frightful, like, you know, to think that, think that the local guards are doing that to us. We have no place to turn to. You know, and who we are we going to turn to is the question. You know, we just don't, I, now I haven't made a complaint as such yet, because for the simple reason I don't know who to complain to, I cannot very well go into the Belmullet Guard Station and face the guards that beat me and tore my skin with a stone making a complaint because I feel that that's as bad as it's going to go. But in time I will, I, I have to do, make a complaint. But it's, it's the fright that you just have nobody to turn to and uh, what is going to happen in the future. Shell are keep pushing their way even though they haven't got the consent. If they have, they haven't shown them to us. So I mean if they had them I'd say it'd be a lot easier for them to show them rather than to go beat them. So I feel, I feel in the future somebody's going to get killed. Now, saying that, I didn't think myself was going to be the first one. You know, I mean, I stare death in the eyes for 10 or 15 minutes. So, I mean, that's that's our biggest scare, that, you know, that our, their target, our family, or something to that effect. So, you know, we have nobody to turn to. We, the government are ignoring us, the guards are ignoring us. So, I mean, where, where do you go from here? You know, we, and we cannot afford to step back because if we do, our whole lives and our health and safety and everything is at risk. So maybe stepping back from this, we'd say this year, and letting them put the pipe in, we can be all blown up next year. So I mean, you know, as they say, what's another year? So I mean, we we have to keep going at this, to try and get them to stop and to listen.